Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and this is the weekly comic book review, live. That's right, we're doing it live tonight. Why? Because I didn't get a chance to do all my early reading. I get to do a little bit of early reading with some indies and some DC books, but none of that got done because of the Huntsville Comic and Pop Culture Expo. But alas, instead of having the video delayed till tomorrow or staying up all night to get it ready at like 3 a.m., we're just going to go live. So we're doing the weekly comic book review. So welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. This isn't how we typically do it, but we're doing it so that you get exactly what you want and what you need before you go see the comic shop in the morning. And we always start with the pick of the week. And by the way, this is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week is the picture of everything else. Number three from Vault Comics. Written by Dan Waters, with artwork by Kishore Mohan, and lettering by Aditya Bittekar. This is by far, for me, the pick of the week. I absolutely love and adore this book. It's got amazing, elegant artwork with beautiful, luscious, like watercolor-esque coloring. The fluidity of the line work uh, works so well with the panel structure. There are moments of this book that are absolutely twisted and sick and truly horrific. The picture of everything else is a brilliant story crafted by Dan Waters, part of the White Noise crew. He will, by, by the way, be appearing here on the channel May 13th, so be aware of that one. Anyway, the picture of everything else is about... It's kind of like a brilliant spinoff from the picture of Dorian Gray. The dude that did the picture of Dorian Gray, what if he started doing landscapes? It's about how art can affect reality. That's like the subtext of the story and the actual freaking narrative of the story, right? It's a fantastic book. It really gets deep into what it's doing, but at the same time has a very chilling and atmospheric tone about it. The artwork is amazing. Aditya Bittekar's lettering is absolute perfection. By far, the best best comic book I read this week was The Picture of Everything Else, issue number three. This is just straight up masterful. Straight up masterful. Speaking of Dan Waters, he's got another book out this week. It's Homesick Pilots, issue number five. This is the final issue of the first arc of Homesick Pilots. So don't worry, more is coming in June, but this wraps up the first arc with a bang. This started as, so it's a book about a haunted house and a punk rock band, and the leader of said punk rock band, um, the Homesick Pilots, winds up going into this haunted house. She gets lost in it. She gets kind of imprisoned by it, and she kind of winds up, because there's this subtextual element to this story where she feels lost and she feels alone, and ostracized from society, and so does the house. And what started as a really nice, easy book, I mean, not so easy, but like, it's gone bonkers. This is crazy. In this book, you have, like, the house becomes this, like, giant mech and goes out and starts fighting. And look at the brilliant, brilliant artwork by Casper Wingard. This also has lettering by Aditya Bittekar, completely different than the lettering in, say, picture of everything else and that's why he's so versatile um the house actually stands up and it does its thing it gets into this like kaiju-esque fight with a ghost homesick pilots has been wild and what's really crazy about it is you're expecting something from dan waters and he gives you something else completely entirely different but it works and it works so exceptionally well homesick pilots kept just ramping things up, whether it was the emotional, dramatic aspect of the story, um, which, by the way, has very rich and compelling characters, and just the idea of the story. What starts is kind of just a ghost story, a haunted house story, and then it turns into, like, ghost mech tech. I don't know. It's wild. It's bonkers. And it's awesome. And it was a fantastic book. Also from Image, we have Home, number one. Home is a uh, pretty decent book. It's about a a son and his mother who are, they're like escaping a very problematic um, situation in Guatemala and they're making it their way to the Mexican U.S. border and they're trying to cross and then they get separated and it's about what they're going through. Um, but there's, there's, there's this other element that I don't want to quite spoil for you that really starts threading its way through the story and by the end of the story it kind of 
rears itself as the main focal point, and it was actually a rather enjoyable book. So Home Number One was pretty freaking awesome. I really liked it. It was a very much a, a grounded, down to earth, sad, tragic story about a human experience, but in a fantastical way that's kind of threaded throughout. Home Number One from Image Comics was pretty decent. Then we have Jules Verne's Lighthouse Number One. This is from the same creative team as The Marked, as uh, what's that book called? Sonata. Sonata was a really Really cool book that I liked, and it should be coming back. So it's David Hine and Brian Haberling. Um, the artwork's pretty solid. It's all right. At times, it can read a bit stiff and stagnant. Um, typically, art like this, but it actually flows pretty well. Unfortunately, though, the book is really thick. It's really big. It's like four ninety nine. There's a lot of story, but it is so incredibly dense that at times it gets a little boggy, it gets a little murky, it gets a little stagnant, it gets a little stiff, it gets a little hard to make it through. It feels a bit cumbersome as you're making your way through the book. So that really kind of took away from my enjoyment of this book. It was a decent idea. Now, I'm not familiar with the Jules Verne story Lighthouse, so I don't know if this is a sci-fi reimagining of the story or if it was already very sci-fi, but this is set. It's a really cool idea. I can see how this would have been a adapted though because it's about you know what a lighthouse is right but it's so out in space there's this uh, section of space where there's a bunch of wormholes um, and there's all these crazy cosmic reality churning storms that come around and so there's it's about the space station that's there kind of acting like a lighthouse to guide these different ships uh, to and fro the lighthouse um, and then something goes wrong and it's about what happens after that so the story is intriguing the characters are relatable enough but just the way that it's kind of put together in a really big dense chunky package um, really kind of makes it cumbersome to get through so it wasn't quite my favorite book of the week then we got Carmen number two y'all I was blown away by Carmen number one and number two was exceptional as well the artwork which I really would like to show you but I think there's like a nude woman on every single page of this um, but it's a uh, Gilliam March I really like this so I've seen a lot of March's work in DC over the years, and at times I like it, and at times I don't. But this seems like he's been able to take his time. Obviously, this is a passion project, um, and it's about this woman who has attempted to commit suicide, and she gets visited pretty much by a version of Death or the Grim Reaper, if you can call it that. And, and, and it's about her kind of floating around, um, and, and it gets a bit melodramatic at times. But it at the same time, it has a charm and a whimsical nature to it. Um, but it does try to get a little bit deep. But what it is that really highlights this book is the artwork. Super clean, very detailed, very complex. Um, the storytelling, the sequential storytelling in here is just straight up masterful. So Carmen number two was really freaking cool. And the artwork's great, but I'm not going to show it to you because every page is like an, a, a naked woman. Um, and it's very well, uh, very well done, very incredibly well done. The Scumbag is here with issue number seven. I've been loving this book by Rick Remender. Each issue has a different artist, but what's amazing is that it feels so cohesive in artistic vision. This time we have Francisco Mobley on the artwork. The artwork is great. This book is wild. So what if the greatest power of the world is given to like the douchiest, worst person you could even think of, right? And so he winds up working for this organization trying to do good, but he's just like addicted to all these drugs. He's always trying to just like bone everything. And he's always presented with all these orgies that he can never partake in. And it's really rather funny. It's super irreverent. It's super in your face, but I'm having so much fun with the scumbag. Um, it's similar to some other books we'll probably get to um, today. But uh, the scumbag number seven was super solid. If you've been liking this book, you're going to continue to like it. And if you didn't like the book by issue seven, like, why are you still reading that? That's totally not your thing, right? Let's jump over to DC. At DC, we got Batman the Detective, number one, a brand new miniseries, Elseworlds, if you will. So it's like a what if. It's a completely different reality, but it's written by Tom Taylor with artwork by Andy Kubert. So I'm very excited about that. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of Andy Kubert's artwork, and he does exactly what you expect him to do in this book. Big, bombastic, superhero action, even though it's a detective story. And that's what Tom Taylor is highlighting in this, is the detective aspect 
of Batman. Look at those powerful shots. Really cool. So this is a an alternate reality, if you will. And it's a Batman that's much older, much more grizzled, much more just over it. He's realized he can't save Gotham. So he just kind of takes a call and he goes globe trotting, right? And this kind of throws back to some of those more globe trotting Batman adventures, but the much more older grizzled Batman. It involves the knight and squire. It's got some really interesting concepts. I thought this was really cool. And I love that Tom Taylor took the time to really focus in on the detective aspect. All the time Batman books can get ridiculed and, and criticized for not really focusing on him being a detective. But they do it here. Albeit with the uh, help of enhanced technology. But it actually works really freaking well. And I thought it was cool. Do we need another Batman book? Probably not, but if qualities like this, sure, why not? It's only six issues. Speaking of six issues, this one's seven. It's Challenge of the Super Sons, because you can't keep a good Super Son down. Let me tell you about this book. It's Peter Tomasi coming back to tell an incontinuity story set in the past of the actual Super Sons. Before Jonathan Kent got aged up, before Damian Wayne decided to leave Batman, quit being Robin, and then go through a whole journey and the backup stories, and then decide to be Robin again, whatever. Before all that, we had a book called Super Sons, and it was great, and it was by Peter Tomasi. He did such a great job. The friendship of Jonathan Kent and Damian Wayne is so pure and charming and in a very odd couple way, but not being like too obvious with it. The artwork is pretty solid. Um, it kind of goes through, you know, Jorge Jimenez, the first time I saw him was on... Um, Super Sons, right? And that's why he did the cover. Great cover right there. And then we had different artists for the second series, which was Adventures of the Super Sons. This is Challenge of the Super Sons. Um, but it's really fun. If you like those Super Sons books, um, rejoice because it's back. And it's back in its full passion and its full glory. And I am so freaking glad. Then we got the Joker issue number two. Y'all, the Joker is awesome. Gillian March doing the artwork on this one, too. It's a completely, you can tell it's his art. But it is a completely different style than what he was doing on Carmen and what he was even doing in recent issues of Batman. What he was doing in his work on Gotham City Sirens. This has got much more of a noirish type tale. Um, this is a really cool book. Now it is $5.99 now for the regular cover because they all have cardstock covers. That sucks that it's $5.99. That really does suck. But I'm going to tell you this. The quality of this book is freaking amazing. It is a grim and gritty detective story. Very much firmly rooted into the DC continuity, into what's coming in um, post-Joker War. It feels so tied in. It's very Gordon-centric. Um, Gord There's some big revelations about what Gordon knows, but we already kind of assumed that he knew, knew some of those things. Um, some big moments here for Oracle, some big moments for uh, Jim Gordon, and a great um, interaction and conversation between Batman and, and, and Gordon. Jim's kind of playing Bruce just a little bit, but the mystery of what's going on um, post Bane's death at the hands of somebody in Arkham Asylum. Is it all set up? Is Bane still alive? I think Bane's still alive, but it doesn't matter because there's the introduction of a new character here that's sure to make a big stink as far as the Bane legacy goes. The Joker number two was damn good. Damn good. Like, that's a book that's just worth it. Just, it's it's so worth it. Batman Urban Legends issue number two is here. This is a $7.99 book, but it's a big anthology book, so it's definitely well worth it if you're into Batman. Um, it's all right, though, because here's the thing. There's a Chip Zdarsky, Eddie Barrows, uh, Red Hood's, Batman Red Hood story in here. That's the highlight. It's 20 pages, and it is freaking awesome. Barrows' artwork is great. Um, the characterization of Jason Todd and the story, the situation he's presented in. He, he's, he's presented with a child, an orphan, <laughs> in a way, kind of almost by his own hand, in a way. Um, and and it's, it's bringing him back to his childhood, so he's got these flashbacks. And you're, but it's all so well done. It's written by Chip Zdarsky, and he's just getting better and better. Now, there's a grifter story in here as well by Matthew Rosenberg and I think Ryan Benjamin that's absolutely fantastic i'm a big grifter fan so i really appreciate that um the there's a what what's the other one there's a there's an outsider story that's part two of the three thing that's okay and there's an oracle story in here which uh it's got some really great artwork by marguerite uh, bennett and it's a pretty decent story i think jordy belair was the writer of that one um no it's uh, cecil castellucci um and it's all it's all right but i'll tell you what if you don't want to get into this because it's $7.99, you don't care about the other stories, I understand that. Wait for the inevitable uh, graphic novel trade paperback release of just this Red Hood story by Chip Zdarsky because it is freaking awesome. 
It is really good. We got Superman number 30 out this week. Now that Philip Kennedy Johnson is, he's coming in as Superman. He did his, his future state books, which were completely, you know, just in the future and different crazy ideas. And then he did his... Um, first two, his first two issues, which was the first issue of Superman 29 and the first issue of action comics. And they were like one story and they were all right. I thought they were good. I thought they had some good ideas and I thought it was really neat to see how we focused on the relationship between Jonathan and, 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 and Clark and like how they're bringing that back because Bendis, I feel kind of ruined what was really kind of going. There was some good momentum building up, um, in the Superman books, especially with the introduction of Jonathan Kent and the new dynamic of Superman being a father, uh, the Peter Tomasi stuff. Dan Jurgens even had some good stuff to do during that era. And then Bendis came in and just kind of sideswiped all of that away, um, and, and it caused the end of Super Sons, and it caused the end of this relationship, temporarily at least, uh, because it's back. Because Philip Kennedy Johnson now, and I believe now that Superman and Action are going to be telling their own separate stories, but this was awesome. I really liked it. I thought this was Philip Kennedy Johnson's best one yet. The artwork's all right. The artwork is by Scott Godlewski. Um, it's pretty cool. It's not my favorite artwork for a Superman book, but it does get the job done. Um, it's got some nice um, dynamic composition on some double-page spreads especially. Um, but it's Superman and Jonathan going off to fight a new threat in space. It's got some anchors into Superman's past, but it's looking boldly into the future. It's got this really great... Uh, how to de how to describe it. it's got this really great like like tension that's building up through it which you know usually in superman books like superman's gonna be okay you're not worried about him he's already died and he came right back but this one actually kind of makes you feel like scared for what could possibly be happening but it's that dynamic between jonathan and clark that jo uh, philip kennedy johnson strikes so perfectly well that makes this so much of a fantastic read. Then we got Wonder Woman 771. Um, Wonder Woman, post-death metal, she went. They asked her to be a god. She said no. She wound up somehow falling to Valhalla. She's got a little bit of uh, amnesia going on. But this book, and that sounds like that would be silly, right? Like an, amnesi mat, an amnesiatic Wonder Woman in Valhalla, like interacting with Thor and doing that kind of thing, right? Um, but no, the book is actually really good. It's got a great fantasy feel to it. Like, it feels so solidly fantasy. It feels like a... Like, last week I read the uh, Sumerian, uh, the, the Ablaze one, like their Conan books, and it has that feel. It just feels like you're sitting down reading an old-school fantasy book, um, very complex, very elaborate, but it never feels boring. The artwork by Travis Moore is fantastic. I'm having a lot of fun with this book and we're bringing in Dr. Psycho, but it's a different version of it. Not, not a different version of him, but because Diana is a little bit, you know, doesn't remember who she is. And, and she's, it's, it's really freaking good. This Wonder Woman book like is blowing me away. Cause I don't typically really like Wonder Woman, but it's not like something so in your face, obviously so good, but it's just very well done. Like I said, it, it reminded me of that Conan Ablaze book I read last week, like Sumerian, but Wonder Woman, and a really great ending. Now, it's got that backup story, and the same thing, same thing with the Superman book. The, both of these backup stories, like Ambush Bug and like a cartoony, like Legends of Themyscira, like those are kind of whack. And it really sucks because those books are so freaking good. If they were $3.99 and it was just those uh, those main stories, they'd be a much easier sell. I'll tell you that one. Um, then DC Black Label, we got Rorschach here with issue number, what is this, seven? Yes, issue number seven. This starts getting bonkers. Okay, so we already know, if you've been reading this book, Tom King, Jorge Fornes, Dave Stewart, doing an amazing job, okay? Building up this detective story. These people that are continuing the legacy of Rorschach in a post-Watchmen HBO TV show world, okay? Um, very meticulously paced, um, very meticulously drawn. The artwork by Jorge Fornes is just amazing in this book. Um, I love the detective story, and it's got a lot of references to comic book past. Now, we know that one of the, new, one of the people that was uh, being the new Rorschach um, is a comic book creator who is v based very much on Steve Ditko, who created The Question, and Mr. A, who very much Alan Moore based Rorschach on. Um, in this one, we straight up get Frank Miller. Like, straight up, uh, Frank Miller's in this book. It's, it's absolutely crazy, but it works. I'm loving this book. It's a tribute to the legacy of comic book creatorship um, and the importance of it. It's, a, it's about... 
It's about comic book creators. And that's so crazy because it's also a post HBO Watchmen series reflecting on the idea of the legacy of Rorschach. And it's very well done and a great noirish detective story. Rorschach, number seven. There you go. Another great detective story we got from DC this week. The Batman Scooby-Doo Mysteries, number one. Let me tell you what. We're always talking about comic books being too expensive, and we always want to talk about, you know, the Todd father, because Spawn's still $2.99, and right on, brother. But so is the Batman Scooby-Doo Mysteries. That's a $2.99 comic book, and definitely well worth it. If you got a youngin' in your life who loves Scooby-Doo and Batman and... Honestly, who doesn't? Like, and if you got a nostalgic feeling for me, like, I mean, not for me, but like me, about those, that Scooby-Doo Batman crossover, like, you need to read this. It's going to be a 12-issue miniseries, but it's only $2.99, and they're reflecting on the actual history of Batman in here. So in this one, like, Shaggy and Thelma, and uh, is it Thelma or Velma? It's Velma, isn't it? Anyway, they get sent back in the past with Scooby to uh, find the mystery of Batman's missing purple gloves it's very cartoony, it's very silly, but it's got a charm to it, and it's got some nice connections to actual, uh, like, DC Batman lore and mythology, and I really liked it, and it's a two ninety nine dollars comic book, and, and very well worth it. You guys want to jump over to Marvel? Let's do it. Spider-Man, Spider-Shadow, number one. This is a what-if book. Now, they didn't, they said that this is a what-if type story. Now, this is a what-if book. They even have the branding right there. It's what-if. Look at that. So, that's pretty cool. So this is a, they're going to do this, these whole new series of, of mini series that are what ifs. They're not going to call them what ifs. You know why they're not calling them what ifs? Because they've already done what if Spider-Man kept the black costume. And that's what this is. This is what if Spider-Man kept the black costume and basically became Venom. But the difference is this is a little bit more sophisticated than a one issue truncated story. Um, it's a little bit more elaborate, a little bit more spread out over four issues. This one's going to be, and it's written by Chip Zdarsky and it's got artwork by Pascal Ferry. i um, really like the artwork, not the best artwork I've ever seen from Pascal Ferry, but I've always loved the black Black costume. Actually, this weekend I got to do a panel with Jim Shooter. We got to talk about that black costume a lot. That, when I was a kid, was so striking to me. I absolutely loved it. The artwork's pretty solid in this book. And like I said, it's just a what if story that we've seen before. So you can definitely predict the beats that the story is going to hit. Spider Man, Peter Parker, obviously getting more and more dark, more and more violent, more and more. Um, um, influenced by the symbiote till he becomes a Venom. Uh, basically, in this version of it, like, it looks really cool by the end of it. So this was pretty solid. And Chip Zdarsky's been doing good work, so let's support him. Then we got Dark Hawk, Heart of the Hawk. Dumbest title of the year so far. But this is a one-shot celebrating 30 years of Dark Hawk. And I'm a huge Dark Hawk fan. Okay, let me be honest. I'm not a huge Dark Hawk fan. But I am a Dark Hawk fan, okay? A very nostalgic for him back in the 90s. So this uh, this has got three different stories. One's by the original creators. And then we got one by Dan Abnett um, that's set during the post-War of Kings era. And then we got one by Kyle Higgins that's setting up some new stuff because they're getting into some new stuff and they're doing a new Dark Hawk book later on in this year. But it's classic. It's cool. If you've never read Dark Hawk and you're wanting this to like make you a Dark Hawk fan, that ain't going to happen. But if you are like a hardcore Dark Hawk fan, you have to read this. If you're a sort of Dark Hawk fan and it's a light week, maybe pick it up. But I'll tell you what, <clears throat> it is not a light week. We got Thor issue number 14 here. This is the finale of Prey. Um, I really do like the finale of this story. I think Nick Klein's artwork is feeling a little bit more chaotic and frantic, but I actually think it's working for the story here. Uh, but this is the final confrontation between... Uh, you know, Thor and the Asgardians against Donald Blake. We got Beta Ray Bill doing some action right there. Great cover, great artwork, very powerful. The story wraps up in a decent enough way. I like the ending of this story. It's good. Here's the problem with it, though. So we've seen this same story, or the way this story ends, we've seen it. Like, the whole idea of Odin's gone, Thor has to take over the throne, Oh, he's confronted with a situation. What would Odin do? What would Thor do different? Here's the thing. The story should be more impactful. But if you're a longtime reader of Thor, you've seen Matt Fraction do this. You've seen uh, Dan Jurgens do this. We've seen this over the last 20 years multiple times. The same kind of character arc for Thor. But if you haven't been reading Thor, I think this is going to be a very satisfying ending. I thought it was a satisfying ending. The only thing is, I was like, okay... 
Now, now I'm ready to see what Donnie's got next. But Donnie K is still doing a great job with Thor, making it big, making it bombastic. Um, but I've seen this story a few times. Just saying. Just the way that, not this story, but just the way. First of all, I've seen the idea of the Donald Blake. What are we going to do with Donald Blake? I've seen that done a, a bunch of times. And I've seen the idea of what would Thor do different than Odin? And how does this grow as care? I've seen this Thor arc so many freaking times. Non-stop Spider-Man, number two. Well, let me tell you something. First of all, that's a lie, because this is the final issue I'm going to read. I am stopping non-stop Spider-Man after this. I did not like the first issue. I gave issue two a chance. It did not wow me. It was a story that felt inconsequential. I didn't really care about it. Um, the art by Chris uh, Bacalo or Bacalo, who I typically really, really like, feels rushed feels just not like his usual self. It is for a book that is supposed to be focused on a very slam bang, kinetically charged action book. It's got moments where it's trying to do it, but it feels cluttered. It feels clunky. And this book is a chore to get through. Even with great pages like that, you see that I'm like, okay, okay, this is going to be cool. It's got some moments that should be cool, but it's got moments where you're just like, I can't make it through it's just too much for a book that's called non-stop spidey yeah that's actually a good explanation because it just feels like this book never freaking ends because it takes so long to read and for me just not that exciting daredevil number 29 a fantastic issue of daredevil because it was an issue with all the artwork done by marco cicetto and that's always a bonus so we're dealing with uh, the same stuff that we've been dealing with so let me be honest yeah King and Black really hurt this book because it was kind of cool to see like Daredevil and Elektra dealing with their own aspects of the King and Black thing. And look at that beautiful, beautiful artwork, right? Um, it was cool to see that, but now we're getting back to the gist of the story. We're, we're, we're telling the same story. We're still doing the same thing, but it's good. And it's way, it's done way better than it was in those King and Black tie-ins, which were still pretty decent. Um, the Matt Murdock stuff in here is cool. It's still a bit silly. I agree with you, Bueller. It's still a bit silly that they're allowing him to wear his mask in the damn jail. I don't understand that whole bit, but whatever, you know, you got to commit to the bit. Um, but the Electra stuff is very cool. Um, she's like teaching this new, like a sidekick almost, like a, her own Robin or something. Really interesting stuff's going on here. A great... Um, segue from the cliffhanger in the last issue into the cliffhanger of this issue daredevil's been great chip sadarsky marco Cicchetto, that's a damn instant classic run then we got wolverine here with issue number 11 i've been loving wolverine and I'm, i still like the gist of the story benjamin percy understands the nature and stoic philosophy of logan he understands the character he knows what to do he's doing some great things with omega red that's a great cover right there um, Omega Red, the vampires versus Wolverine, but the art in this book did nothing for me. It Scott Eaton, who is a veteran in the industry, he's a bit old school, but let me tell you something. There's just nothing dynamic about his line work here. It just doesn't, it feels like work for hire. It doesn't feel like anything substantial. And that's what really bogs down this book. It's got some cool story elements. It's got some cool story beats. And there are even some moments where Scott Eaton's work kind of shines just a little bit, but for the most part, it just doesn't. It just feels a bit flat, and I think it's because of the art. But Wolverine's still okay. X-Men Children of the Atom, number two. This is a book like, I feel like I wouldn't like and I shouldn't like, but I do. I can really like this book for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but, so it's about this group of young X-Men, and this book is a bit wordy too. And that's something Vidayala has been accused of as being overly verbose, and I do believe that is an accurate criticism of their work, but I am really liking these characters. You know, they're, they're, I guess they're zoomers. I don't really necessarily relate to them, I guess, but I don't know. It feels kind of fun. It feels kind of fresh. I was intrigued. I was into it. It had a nice pace. It had a nice flow, had decent artwork. It's about, I think the, I, I'm getting the impression that these are mutants who no longer have their powers. Um, and they're trying to hide that fact, but I don't know if that's necessarily what's going on because it's not being very obvious about it. Um, these new characters though, like I immediately was just like, I'm not interested in any of these, but I'm actually liking them because the, the character work by Vita is incredibly delicate and very well done. So children of the Atom number two out this week. Then we got Maestro War and Pax number four, the penultimate issue 
Um, it's pretty solid and it's all right. Like, I didn't really like the last Maestro. I've said that before. I just didn't really like the Hercules stuff. Um, but this one I like a little bit more because it's involving the Pantheon. They've kind of got uh, Maestro at the end of the last issue and it's all on the orders of Doom. Um, so you got an ultimate confrontation of Doom versus Maestro. Um, and we know that Doom's going to lose. So I've really been enjoying this book, but I'm already st uh, preparing myself to not enjoy issue five because nobody can beat Doom. You know, but anyway, this was a really fun, nice, solid issue. Peter David is a very consistent writer, um, and this is a very fun, consistent comic book. It doesn't do anything too much. It doesn't do anything too little. It's just, it's Goldilocks, baby. You know what I'm saying? It's right there. Fantastic Four number 30 is here. How annoying is it when you get a tie-in to an event after the, the event ends? That's pretty obnoxious, but this is another King and Black tie-in with Fantastic Four dealing with the idea that, oh, the Thing and Human Torch are nullified. Oh, how are, we, how are they going to survive? Oh, don't worry. It all winds up okay. Um, it's all right. It's, Dan Slott's really hit a stride with balancing um, the characters and understanding their voices and getting all these, mo these things in motion. Now I hope that we can move past King and Black, and now we'll see what's going on. We got the wedding of dr doom so that's making me a little it's making me a little bit nervous but it was an okay issue it was decent but it is so obnoxious when we get tie-ins to an event that already ended so obnoxious anyway let's jump to idw we got kanto and the city of giants if you're a fan of kanto there's no reason why you shouldn't pick this up this isn't the next big book and adventure for kanto but this is kind of like a an appendix, right? This is a stepping stone. This is a three-issue series. It is written by David M. Boer as well, as uh, Drew Zucker still being credited there. But Sebastian Perez is the artwork, uh, is the artist, and the artwork is great. It's not Zucker, and it's not Estoni, but it does a great job of capturing the feel and making you feel like you're reading a Canto book. And it's very tied into what's come before and what's coming after. So this is quite essential. Um, but I love it. Canto is a great book that gets to the heart of story. It gets to the heart of your heart. Seriously, I cannot say enough things about Canto. Canto continues to just deliver. This isn't quite as impactful as some of the previous issues have been. But it's still very fun, light, fairy tale, fable, fantasy story that resonates for people of all ages. Canto out this week. We also have Lock and Key, Sandman Universe, Hell and Gone. So this is a crossover between Joe Hill's Lock and Key and Sandman. And it's set in the early days of Sandman, like when right when Dream got captured. This was kind of set up in the Zero issue, um, but I liked it. So it's, it's Joe Hill and it's uh, Gabriel Rodriguez, right? Yeah. So it's the same creative team as, you know, Lock and Key. And it works. It works really well. The idea of taking these two stories, these two families, um, the locks, you know, from Lock and Key and, and, and Key House and how you merge that into the Sandman mythology and what you're doing, it, how you're doing it and why you're doing it. It worked really well. It's a very dense issue that reads very fluidly. It's very impactful. The artwork is great. The composition is good. It's got these big, uh, nice panels, but lots of detail in the background. Really a great read. If you're a Sandman fan, uh, check it out for sure. If you're a Lock and Key fan, check it out for sure. I really, really liked it. From Scout Comics, I really got to highlight Locust. Locust number one was fan freaking tastic. This book was awesome. First of all, look at the artwork. The artwork is by Alex Nito. It's written by Massimo Rossi. Um, it's really cool. It's like a post-apocalyptic story where something terrible, some virus has been unleashed on Earth. Um, and, and we're showing a little bit of information about how we got there, but we're mostly also dealing with just this dude who's alone and we're getting little snippets of his past, but the artwork is phenomenal. This would get do Mignola proud, lots of stark blacks, lots of great composition, really good stuff, atmospheric, moody. This was a fantastic book. Issue two is not coming out till June, but if your shop's got it, check it out from Scout. That's the variant cover you can get on their web store or at certain shops that order directly from Scout. Locust number one, <clears throat> that's the best first issue of a Scout comic book I think I've ever read, except for the one coming out in June, which is called Chaos Agent. But that book is pretty freaking awesome. From Boom, we have Proctor Valley Road 
number two. Proctor Valley Road, number two, did a great job of continuing the story. It's got a Stranger Things in the 70s kind of vibe, but it definitely takes a different direction in episode number two, in issue number two. This is written by Alex Child and Grant Morrison with artwork by Naomi Franquise. Um, I really like this book. Um, so it's basically about these four young women who are trying to get money to go see Janis Joplin. And in the first issue, they take these dudes to uh, on a on a ghost tour, basically, to Proctor Valley Road, which is believed to be haunted. Um, the guys start acting like complete dickbags, and then they leave them there and go off. And then the dudes just go missing. They never show up. So now these four girls are, are kind of like suspects in their, the, the missing person's case. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, there's some real ghosty stuff going there it gets crazy the characters are all very different unique very compelling captivating and relatable the story is cool and the moments when they hit that are supposed to hit hit very well proctor valley road issue number two i thought was even better than issue number one mighty morphin issue number six you know ryan parrot's just been crafting the best power ranger story we've ever been given um not just in particular with this issue but just since he's taken over the run um, and I'm just loving it. If you're a Power Rangers fan, this is a must read. I also think it's just one of the best superhero books out there on shelves right now. The artwork is very colorful, elaborate, and it pops. It pops like crazy. Um, I love this book. It gets into the nuance of the characters. You're understanding more about their motivations. Um, like, for instance, Tommy and Kimberly are having a little bit of drama um, because the new Green Ranger has been revealed. And, oh, yeah, it's her ex-boyfriend. And then you got great elaborations on Zordon, his history, even his personality. This is a really great book filled with action, filled with kinetically charged composition and, and nice energetic flow throughout the book. Ryan Parrott and company doing a great job with the Power Rangers legacy. Let me tell you that. Phantom on the scan number one is a new one from Aftershock. Big week for Aftershock here. This one's okay. Cullen Bunn, Mark Torres, the artwork in this book is phenomenal. He's using a technique in this book that makes it very dark, murky, and atmospheric, where it looks like the artist is using fingerprints to actually shade some of the artwork. And there's like this ghost kid, and it's just very effective on those pages. Can you see that? Um, so it's very effective on those pages. The book itself doesn't tell me enough about what's going on. It doesn't tell me enough about the character. It doesn't tell me enough about it. Now, this is an Aftershock book and it's $4.99, but I just feel like I got a half a story. I don't really... The artwork was very, very compelling, but the story was engaging, but it just didn't give me enough to justify me wanting to come back. Now, it was cool enough and it's got a cool enough character uh, cover and I love the... I mean, I was digging it, but it just... I didn't get enough to hook me and you got to hook me in issue number one. You can't wait to hook me by issue number two. You got to hook me in issue number one. That one didn't hook me. Here's something that hooked me though. Immediately it was maniac of New York. Now maniac of New York and issue three is out this week. This is by Elliot Kalin with artwork by Andrea Muti. The artwork is fantastic. This is the artist of fearscape, dark interlude, um, Vlad Dracul, um, the color palette that he chooses is absolutely fantastic. He uses these sickly greens to go along with these these splotches of... It makes those splotches of red very unnerving and unsettling, and it works. This is kind of like the unofficial sequel to the Jason franchise. It's like, what if Jason goes to hell and it never happened, right? And this is the sequel to Jason Takes Manhattan, just years later. Jason's still out there, and it's totally a ripoff of Jason, but it's doing what it's doing. Now, the first issue was a little bogged down in exposition, and it was kind of wordy, and I liked the concept, and I loved the artwork, but it went, but issue two was really cool, right? Issue three is the best issue yet. This is incredibly well-paced. It's a thrill to read. It's a bit of a brisk read, but you want to kind of just linger on those nuances in the color, in the, in the shading there. Um, and then it's got some very impactful moments. I really like that. Maniac in New York, number three. <laughs> man. Oh, man. Then we got Scout's Honor, number four. This is such a great book. Written by David Pepos with artwork by Luga, or Luca Casalanguida. But uh, this is really cool. So it's about what if, what if the world kind of went through an apocalyptic situation and society rebuilt itself around the code of the Boy Scout manual. 
So it's this very dystopian, mutated monsters type thing that's going on. But you got a very compelling story in the midst of this crazy post-apocalyptic story. It's digging into a lot of, of topics and subtext, and at the same time giving us a very thrilling, exhilarating, and exciting adventure. Um, but the character work is really what, what makes this solid. And the artwork and everything works in conjunction. This is a very well-written comic book. It's a very well-executed comic book. Um, it's adventurous, and it reaches deep, and it's doing it exceptionally well. Scout's Honor number 4. If you're not reading it, you need to read it. Undone by Blood or The Other Side of Eden, issue number 2. Second issue is $4.99. At least we get the cardstock cover, but I'm not liking this trend. Loving this artwork, though. Sammy Cavella... Jason Wordy, Hassan Osman El Howe on the lettering, doing an exceptional job on this book. It's written by Zach Thompson, Lonnie Nadler. So the original Undone by Blood <clears throat> was about a young woman who was on a quest for revenge. And while she's on this quest for revenge, she is reading a book of Solomon, what is it, Solomon something. Um, but she's reading this series, this Western book, right? It's allegedly a series of Westerns. And so you're getting a classic Western story and you're getting a more neo-Western story. And that was really, really cool. And you're doing the same thing in volume two, The Other Side of Eden, but it's a different book. It's a different Saul. It's a different cowboy book. Um, and it's a different story set in, in, I think this is set like in the 20s or 30s, right? But it's a kind of about like a, a heist. And and the, the old school Western is about a heist too. So they kind of, are relating to each other. So I really like the concept of doing a different story. This has been made a TV show coming up soon or something. So maybe they'll do an anthology nature with that. That could be cool. But Undone by Blood, The Other Side of Eden, number two was pretty solid. And if you're liking that franchise, I think you're, you'll enjoy that one. Ginny Zero, number one from Dark Horse Comics. This was a pretty cool book. It was, as I really liked it, it was written by Dave uh, Duanich, and Brockton McKinney with artwork by Magenta King. The artwork is pretty freaking solid. I really like it. So it's kind of a, it's kind of like a Neon Genesis Pacific Rim, you know, like, you know, people fighting giant monsters type thing. But the idea in this one is that the best hero, it's kind of like almost like a scumbag thing, but not quite so obnoxious or as irreverent. Um, but it does have some irreverency and some really cool stuff. The artwork is pretty fire, but it's about, these giant monsters and these monsters attack and the best person to fight them is someone that may not really want to do it. She's kind of wasting her life away. She's just getting drunk and high all the time. I'm um, just kind of partying all the time, not really doing much of living up to her potential. And then she gets called to like actually come back to save the day. And, and it actually did a pretty solid job. So Jenny zero number one, if you're a Kaiju fan, I definitely recommend that you check it out. The artwork was pretty solid. It took a minute to really grab me, but by the middle of that book, I was completely captivated all the way through. Black Hammer Visions, issue number three. This is an issue written by Chip Sadarsky. He's got some solid books out this week. Johnny Christmas doing the artwork. Um, artwork's pretty simple. It doesn't really do too much for me, but it is giving us a very much... Uh, it's giving us an Abraham Slam story that's so close to what we're getting in Falcon and Winter Soldier. Basically, Abraham Slam is a, you know, he's getting old and there's a new slam, like Captain Slam coming up and he's, he uses a gun and he like, is he's very brutal and violent and Abe's like, yo, I gotta, I gotta get back out there. I gotta like set the record straight. I gotta end this. Um, but he, he just gets his ass kicked. So it's about him dealing with his old age. Black Hammer Visions have been really cool, interesting one-shot stories set in the Black Hammer universe, but by different creators. Seeing Chip Zdarsky get it to do something there, it's pretty cool. It was pretty decent. Next up, we got Young Hellboy. His name's Young Hellboy. Young Hellboy, The Hidden Land, issue number three. Um, it's solid and it's cool and it's fine, but if you're not already a Hellboy fan, I wouldn't recommend it. It's not going to do anything for you. But if you are a Hellboy fan, it's decent and it's interesting, but it's one of those ones that just doesn't quite resonate like some of the other Hellboy stuff does. The artwork's a bit too bright and in your face for me if it was a little bit darker and murky and more atmospheric like that cover i would think i would like it a bit better but i'm still enjoying it because his name's young hell boy from awa upshot we got chariot number two this is a really interesting kind of take on a concept like knight rider it's about a car that's uh 
kind of possessed by a ghost. So imagine Kit's an actual ghost, not like a, a program or something. So this dude who's been down on his luck, trying to get his life back together, he comes across this car, and he comes across the woman whose ghost is inhabiting this car, and they wind up having their paths have to cross. Um, but it's a really cool book. It's got a very 80s synthwave aesthetic. It's written by Brian Hill, who's a fantastic writer. It's got a great pace. The dialogue is spot on. The artwork's pretty solid. And just put on some synthwave music. Some Put on the Miami Vice soundtrack. Just kick back and read some Chariot. This will take you back into your 80s soul chariot was fantastic redemption number three right yes number three of five is here from awa upshot this one's by krista faust mike diodato jr i'm liking this one it's obviously uh linda hamilton um but this is about a woman who's like this it's a sci-fi western but a little bit more dirty and gritty kind of like the dirty and gritty aspects of firefly but i mean really dirty and gritty um <clears throat> so it's about this cowgirl cowboy whatever um who is a bit old and grizzled gunfighter a gunslinger um and she's asked to help this young woman with a, a task of revenge she doesn't want to do it but she agrees to train the woman and and of course her quest the young lady's quest is all wrapped up in her past and and her mystery and all that stuff so it's a typical cliche story but it's actually pretty well done my diodato's artwork pretty solid all the way through the pick of the week was a vault book but we got another vault book here it's the autumnal number six right yes number six okay so last issue they really clarify a lot of what's going on in this book and in this issue now that it's all clarified they just ramp it up if you for instance if this was a horror movie this is the moment like at the end of act two where the shit really starts hitting the fan and or the leaves start hitting the car windows but you can feel the tension you can feel the anxiety coming off the pages um the atmospheric artwork the way it's set up and then by the end of it you're like oh it's really heavily leaning into that kind of a story really good this has been a slow burn but it's been a steady slow burn that has just erupted for me in issue number seven the autumnal number six from Vault. And finally, let's talk about Space Bastards number four. I'm loving this book. Another in-your-face, irreverent, just nasty book. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's about, the basic premise of Space Bastards is this. What if the Intergalactic Postal Service was kind of like a bounty system? And so you, pay, you got paid a bounty for delivering a package, right? Okay, that's cool. But if you kill the person taking the package and you take the package... The bounty goes up because it just switched hands. So now we got a galaxy that's just like all like everybody's out, out there killing each other trying to deliver these packages. And in these pages, we're building it up so well. Like the book is funny. It's, it's rambunctious. It's boisterous. It's irreverent. It's in your face, right? But at the same time, it's so perfectly well structured. The way the story is structured each issue kind of focuses a little bit on its own different character, but it still wraps it all up completely, uh, perfectly together. Derek Robertson is the artist of Transmetropolitan fame. It's violent. It's grotesque. It's, 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 it's fantastic. Space Bastards was awesome. So that's what I read this week. That's what I thought about it. Thank you guys so much for checking out the video. We really do appreciate it. I want to know right now what was your pick of the week let us know in the comments down below um and i know we did this live and this isn't how we typically do it and usually when i'm live i love chatting with you guys and i didn't get a chance to pay attention to what y'all were doing but i really do appreciate the super chat michael thank you so much for that so we will end with the joker video but before we end i will say this Thank you so much for watching the video. Please do check us out at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts, blogs, and a whole lot more. If you want to support the channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash PCP like Tomorrow Cinema, my man, and others. We really do appreciate all your support. Thank you so much. Please do like, share, subscribe. Click the notification bell so you don't miss a single video, including when we go live. That's all for now. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.
I do want to give you a little bit of post credits. I want to say that in no way was Silver Coin number one a spite pick. I don't care what Bueller says. Thanks for the super chat, buddy.